Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wild Geese Virtual Shebeen. Shebeen is where we talk with interesting people in the worldwide Irish community about their diverse interests and talents. Today, we'll be joined by Galway based storyteller Rab Fulton. Rab specializes in reimagining Irish and Scottish folk tales, so he's the perfect guest to anchor our Irish myths and legends focus here on the Wild Geese.irish. Rab is so entertaining. I know all of your friends will want to join us in the Shebeen tonight. So please share the link for this broadcast on social media right now. My name is Kelly O'Rourke. I'm here in my home in Connemara, just a short drive away from Rab, who's in Galway. And we're so glad that you've joined us. If you're a member of the Wild Geese and you're watching live, we encourage you to interact with us via the main chat room on the wildgeese.irish. If you're not a member, you'll need to sign up for a free profile on the Wild Geese in order to chat with us. You can also tweet at us, at the Wild Geese. Now we want to welcome our guest, Rab Fulton. Welcome to the Wild Geese, Rab. Hello, Kelly. How's it going? How are you doing? Doing well. <laughs> Will you start us out with a story, Rab? Rab's first tale for us is going to be The City Beneath the Waves. Take it away, Rab. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, I'm going just to tell a story. Uh, it's raining here, um, surprisingly enough, in Galway. Uh, it's very wet. So this is a kind of nice story. Um, if you're in anywhere, it's wet and rain. It's a nice little story for you. It's a story from Galway Bay, and it's from about 100 years ago, and it's about the fishing fleet um, down the Cladder. At that time, there was about oh, 90 boats down the Cladder. And one summer, the cry went out, the mackerel are running, the mackerel are running. So all the men and all the boys were out getting their, their boats ready to go out and get the fish. So they were uh, working away, and there was three boys who were particularly uh, happy that morning because they, their father had said to them, I'm too old to go fishing. So he gave them his boat, so their own boat. So they were working away, checking everything, the sails and the nets and all this kind of thing. And then um, they heard a commotion further up the coast there. And they looked up and they saw a wee old woman. And she was walking down the cladder. And she was going up to each of the boats and she was trying to talk to the men. And she was walking, she had a white horse with her. And she was going up to each of the boats and saying, Men of the Cladder, men of the Cladder, listen to me. And the men of the Cladder all just oh, chased her off. There shouldn't be women at the boats. And they would chase her off. And she went to the next boat, men of the Cladder, listen to me. And they chased her off. And she went down the whole, all the fleet there all the fishing fleet, and they all chased her off, and all the boats got their sails up, they all caught the breeze, and they all went out to Galway Bay, until there was only one boat left, and that was the boat with the three lads on it. And the woman came up to them, and by the time she got to them, her voice was sore, and she said, men of the cladder, listen to me. And the three lads looked at her, and you know, they'd never been called women, but men before, and their chest swelled with pride, and looked at the women, and you know, they were just suddenly feeling very proud of themselves of their own boat. They've been called men. And they looked at the women and they said, how can we help you? And the old woman standing there with her white horse, she said, men of the cladder, listen to me. There's a storm brewing out in the Atlantic and it's going to hit the hills of Ireland and come tumbling down into Galway Bay. And when it hits Galway Bay, it's going to be as cruel and as savage as the devil himself. Do not go out fishing. And the lads looked at her and said, you know, we need to fish. It's a lovely sunny day. We need the money. We need the money. We have to go fishing. So the woman said, well, if you have to go fishing, do one thing for me. Take with you an axe and a hook and a long, sharp knife. So the boys, they sent the youngest lad back to the house and he got an axe, a hook, and a long sharp knife and put it in the boat. And the lads, they got the sail up, they caught the breeze, and out they went, sailing on Galway Bay. And it was a lovely day, the three boys there, they were quite young, they were only ages, what, 18, 16, 14, they were out in the boat catching fish, there was so much fish, the nets were filling up, all the boats in Galway Bay were heaving with fish. But then about two o'clock in the afternoon, the little breeze had been filling the sails, stopped and there was an awful stillness in the water and then all the fishermen looked up 
and they saw the hills of Clare. The sky was getting darker and darker. And before they could even shout the word storm, suddenly it was on them. An enormous storm, huge waves going up and down and up and down and throwing the boats about like corks in a bottle. And the rain was beating their faces and the lightning was flashing. And all the men and all the boys in the boats were trying to turn around, trying to get back to the cladder. And the three lads, they were trying to get back, and up came a wave. And the wave was oh, 60 feet high. And the belly of the wave was black. And it was rolling towards the boat. And just as it was about to swallow up the boat, the oldest lad, the 18-year-old, without even thinking, he grabbed a hold of the axe. And he shouted out, God keep us from harm. And he threw the axe at the wave. And the minute the axe touched the wave, the wave parted. Like the Red Sea before Moses. And came round either side of the boat. So the lads were thinking they were saved. But of course up came a second wave. And it was 80 feet high. And its belly was red. And it was rolling towards the little boat. And just as it was about to swallow it, the second lad, the 16 year old, without even thinking, turned around and he grabbed a hold of the hook. And he shouted out, God keep us from harm. And he threw the hook at the wave. And the minute the hook touched the wave, the wave parted with the Red Sea before Moses and came round either side of the boat. But of course, up came the third wave. And the third wave was a hundred feet high. And its belly was silver with lightning. And the crest of the wave was all filled with the broken up remains of smashed up boats and drowned men. And it was screaming towards a little boat. And just as I was about to swallow the little boat, the youngest lad, the fourteen year old, without even thinking, turned around and he grabbed a hold of the long sharp knife. And he shouted out, God keep us from harm. And he threw the knife at the wave. And the minute the knife touched the wave, the wave parted, like the Red Sea before Moses. And better still, it left a little swell behind. And the swell pushed the boat all the way back. To the cladder. When they got back to the cladder, the lads thought they were saved, they were going to get out of the boat and tie it up, but just as they were doing so, they looked up, and who was standing on the shore but the old woman with the white horse. And she held up her hand, and she said, Ah, now, lads, you cannot go home yet. There's one more thing you have to do. Get up on my horse. So the three lads got up on the white horse and the old woman began walking. And she didn't walk into the cladder or walk into Galway City or walk up into Salt Hill. She walked onto the water. She walked onto the water with the horse. And she slowly began to sink onto the water. And the water came up to her ankles and up to her knees, up to her waist, up to her neck. And the water swallowed the woman and it swallowed the white horse. And it swallowed the three lads. And suddenly the three lads found themselves beneath the waves. And the old woman walking and walking. She was walking on the sand and the seaweed. And she was walking further and further down and down and down and further and further out into Galway Bay. And the lads were on the horse. They were looking at fish swimming by and octopuses and all sorts. And they were kind of, wow. The woman kept walking. And eventually, halfway across Galway Bay, two miles beneath the waves, they came across a city. And the women began walking through the city with the white horse and the three lads on it. And they were looking around at all these huge buildings, beautiful buildings made of green Connemara marble. And the woman was walking through the city. And as she walked, the lads could hear music. And the music got louder. And the woman walked and walked with a white horse and the three lads until she came to the end of the city. And at the very end of the city, there was a huge green field. And she began to walk through the field. And now the lads could hear the music even louder. And the lads looked about. And all around this huge field, all around the circumference, they could make out the bloody shapes of dancers and musicians and all that kind of thing. 
but they couldn't quite see them clearly. And the woman just kept walking with a horse, and she walked them all the way across the field. And the far end of the field was a huge big house, a big mansion. And when he got up there, the woman said to the lads, come off the horse. You have to go into the mansion. You have to go into the mansion and bring back what is yours and only what is yours. And when you're in there, you cannot say a word. You cannot speak not even one word. So the three lads got off the horse, stepped into the building, and they were inside and saw three doors. So the oldest lad, the 18-year-old, he opened the first door. And he stepped into a room. And in the room was a big bed. And on the big bed was a big woman. Kind of wearing a negligee, short negligee, big woman, big hair she had, big black hair. Hair as black as the belly of the first wave. And sticking out of her head was the axe. The lad was horrified. But he knew what he had to do. So he tiptoed across the room and he reached over he grabbed the hold of the axe and it tucked and it tucked on. Oh, it was embedded in the woman's skull and he could hear the sound of metal on bone. <laughs> and finally, oh, he took the axe from her head. And when the axe was from the woman's head, well, the wound healed up and she opened her eyes and she sat up and she looked at the lad and she said, Ah, oh, thank you. But the boy blushed and he knew not to say a word. And the woman said, can I give you a gift? And she opened her hand and her hand was the most beautiful pearl necklace. A gift, she said, for taking away my terrible wound. But the boy, he knew not to touch the necklace. He knew not to speak a word. He just held onto the handle of the axe as tight as he could. And he stepped back and he stepped back. And he reached behind himself and he opened the door again. And he stepped through the door and then he shut the door. And when the door was shut, the spell was broken. Well, now it was the turn of the second lad, the 16-year-old. So he went to the second door, and he opened the second door, stepped into a room. And in the room was a big bed. And on the big bed, big woman, short negligee, big red hair on her, as red as the belly of the second wave. And sticking out her head was the hook. The lad was horrified, but he knew what he had to do. So he tiptoed her across, he bent down, and he grabbed the handle of the hook. And he tucked, and he tucked. Oh, it was so stuck in there, and I could hear the sound of metal on bone. And he tucked and tucked, and finally, ah, He took the hook from the woman's head. And when the hook was from her head, the wound healed over. And she opened her eyes and she said, ah, thank you. And she sat up and she said, can I give you some food and drink? And she clipped her fingers and all these wonderful food and drink appeared in the room. And the boy knew not to touch the food and he knew not to touch the drink. And he knew not to speak a word. He just held on to the handle of the hook and he stepped back and he stepped back. And he got to the door and he opened the door and he stepped through the door. He stepped out of the room again, closed the door and shoo. The spell was broken. Well, now it was the turn of the third lad, 14 years of age. He opened the door of the third room and he stepped into the room. Big room, big bed. Big woman, short negligee. Big woman with big silver hair, as silver as the belly of the third wave. And sticking out of her head was a long, sharp knife. But the lad was horrified, but he knew what he had to do, and he, he reached over and he grabbed the handle of the knife. And he tugged, and he tugged. Oh, and it was so embedded in her skull, he could hear the sound of metal on bone. <coughs> he took the knife from her head. And when the knife was from her head, the woman, oh, she opened her eyes, and the wound healed. And she sat up, and she looked at the lad, and she said, Oh, thank you. Well, the boy blushed. He knew not to say a word, but the woman was looking at him, and she had big, dark eyes. 
And the lad was looking at the woman and suddenly realised he was in a room with a woman on a bed. And it was not his mammy or his granny or the one next door. It was a gorgeous woman in a negligee with big hair and big dark eyes staring at him. And then the woman spoke, and she spoke the most terrible words the boy had ever heard. She looked at him, and then she said, Tell me, have you ever kissed a girl? And the boy oh, he held on tighter to the handle of the knife, and he was shaking, and he wanted to leave the room. From his belly button upward, he wanted to leave. From his belly button downwards, he wanted to stay. And he walked back, and he sat in the bed, and the woman looked at him and she said, Have you, have you ever kissed a girl? And with that, she puckered up her lips. And the poor boy couldn't help himself. His lips puckered up too. And she began bending towards him. And he began bending towards her. And they get closer and closer and closer. And their mouths get mere and mere watery and mere and mere puckered. Nearer and nearer and nearer until suddenly... The door was kicked open. His two brothers ran in, grabbed a hold of him, dragged him out of the room, slammed the door shut, and the spell was broken, and the lad was saved. Well, the three boys left the mansion then. And outside was the old woman with the white horse, and she said, well done. You got what was yours and all what was yours. The axe, the hook and a long sharp knife. Now you can come home. So he got on the horse, she walked through the field, and heard the music again, and he could see the dancers now. And he got a shock, for they recognised the dancers. Half the dancers were women, as beautiful as the women in the house. And the other half of the dancers were the men and boys of the cladder who'd been out fishing that morning. But they didn't get a chance to speak to them, the woman just kept walking with the horse. She walked through the field, she walked through the city, and she took them all the way back to the cladder. And when they got back to the cladder, it was night time. The storm was over. But the air was filled with the terrible, keening wails of the women of the cladder mourning their drowned husbands and sons. And when they got there, the old woman, they got into dry land, she said, Now, lads, come off the horse, you can go home now. And the lads got off the horse. And then he looked at the old woman and said, are we the only ones? Are we the only ones to survive? And the old woman said, you are. And the lad said, but, but why? And the old woman said, no reason. And the lad said, ah, now in the name of all that's holy, there must be a reason why we three and we three alone survived. And the old woman looked at him and said, well, if you want a reason, perhaps it's this. You three and you three alone survived because you three and you three alone took the time to listen to an old woman from the cladder. <laughs> excellent, excellent. I enjoyed that so much, Rob. Thank you. I'm going to have a wee cup of tea because I'm a bit dry here. Yeah, no problem. I couldn't help but think as I was listening that the the way we use mythology is to explain things that we don't understand and yeah. I know there are monuments all over Galway and, and elsewhere around Ireland to lost sailors and lost fishermen, yes. yeah. sons and fathers and husbands and I imagine you know these stories came about from people trying to make sense of the lo those losses through the years. Oh yes, I mean, uh, I, I mean that particular story. I mean, you go with bears the monument in the cloud to the the nine the nine men that were drowned, and 
what was that, 1911 or something like that? Yeah, so I mean, there's always losses. And um, that story, that's one of the ones I wrote about for the articles. And, and again, it's a story that, um, it is about, it's a story about how the sea brings blessings, which, you know, it brings the fish, which you, you eat and you use to pay for your house and your food. But it also brings a curse that it can, it can take people away and you never see them again. Mm. And uh, yeah, and there's elements in that story. I mean, it's a folk tale, but there's elements of mythology in there as well. You know, the three women with their hair, you know, the red hair and the black hair and the silver hair, that goes right back to the children of Lear. You know, the three sisters that were offered to Lear as wives. And Lear, of course, is the god of the sea. And there's all this going on just in this one simple story, you know. So, um, and that's, I mean, it's the article that people can read the article on, on the Wild Geese website. It okay. explains a bit more about it there. Yeah. yeah. It's one of my favorite stories. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. And I had never heard it in its entirety, and you tell it very well. I enjoyed that. Thank you. Now, Rab, will you tell us, um, people who are tuned in, um, if you if you have a good ear, you've noticed that Rab isn't from Galway originally. He's got that lovely Scottish brogue. I've never heard such a enthusiastically rolled R as we had in that story. Oh, fine enough. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. I'm often complimented on my arms. It's, uh, it's, uh, yes. So how did you wind how did you wind up here in Ireland? Um uh, you know it's a funny thing, like like a lot of people from the west of Ireland, you know I mean the west of Ireland, the west of Scotland, um you know, I, I, I also have an Irish heritage as well, you know, and I explained a lot of that and the kind of Articles. So I've always been aware of Ireland, and I obviously have been to Ireland before I settled here. But the reason I, I finally came was um, my wife and I, who met in Wales, we didn't want to live, we weren't sure where to live. So we figured we'd go to Ireland, and um, we basically got a big map and we got a pin and we closed our eyes and we put the pin in the map. Unfortunately, the pin landed in Galway Bay, the actual water, which we thought was very good. So we kind of cheated a wee bit, and then we kind of moved. It was looking, and we just kind of moved in a wee bit onto dry land. And so it was Galway. We, we landed with the pin, kind of went to Galway. So we came, and we got a bit confused, though, being um, young and in love and stupid when you are. And we got a, a, an aeroplane ticket token thing, I can't remember what we got it for. And we thought it was going to Galway, but we ended up in Cork. And we landed in Cork and we had nothing. We had, we had a bag of clothes and that was it, and a flask of tea. You know, and we landed in Cork and people kept telling us it was Cork and we were saying, no, 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 this is Galway. And, uh, and, and, but slowly we managed to get to Galway. And we've been here now, uh, oh my God, uh, 16 years. I think we've been in Galway now, 16 years. We finally got here. Though I do visit Cork occasionally. It's a lovely thing. I do like Cork. <laughs> If there's any Cork people out there. Very good, very good. Now, how did you um, begin to be a storyteller, and how did you decide to make that your career? Um, do you know, um, I have never made a decision about my career in my entire life. <laughs> I, I, I have got to where I have in life by completely avoiding making decisions of any sort. I, my one decision is throughout life, I, I say yes a lot to everything. I just say yes. But folks say that, I say yes. God, so yes, no problem. I come from from Scotland, and um, you know, and, and I was always brought up with stories and people around me telling things. You know, Scottish people, Irish people, always been surrounded by stories, and also reading stories. My, my family are reading, and. Um, one of the first stories I actually remember when I was we was um, Ushin, you know, um, and Tiernan Oak, that lovely story. So there's always been those stories around, and uh, I've always enjoyed them and engaged with them. And I've always loved fantastic stories. I've found it very easy to step into fantastic stories, whether it's folk tales or novels or sci-fi or whatever. And I can step in and really enjoy them. But particularly Scottish and Irish stories, I can really... I can just step in and live in them and breathe them and feel the the humour or the horror or whatever of the stories. And um, but there was never a decision ever to tell stories. It was just they were right there, and it was I 
using, I was always telling stories in some way. I, when I was in school, I'd done a lot of uh, uh, poetry, and um, and then I was involved in a lot of the the political campaigns in the 1990s in Scotland. Are now everybody what's going on in the British election just now? That all goes back to that then. And uh, when I was involved in that, I was doing cultural things, performances, but I was also doing a lot of. Um, press releases and stuff as well for all the different campaigns that were going on, which is another form of storytelling. So there was a some form of storytelling in itself coming on. And then when I came to Ireland, obviously uh, people are talking to you and they're asking you, they're asking you about history, they're asking you about politics, but they're also asking you about the stories. And I was just telling the stories I knew. And that started that using the stories as a way of communicating. But then that got complicated as well, because I kept telling people there were Scottish stories, and folk kept saying, no, those are Irish stories. And, and it all got very complicated, because every Irish story has a Scottish equivalent, and every Scottish story has a Scottish equivalent. And I, I eventually realised after 10 or 11 years to top, stop telling Irish people that the stories were Scottish, and just I, I kind of just relaxed and realised that actually the, the stories exist in their own way, and there's different versions in Scotland and Ireland, and there's different versions around Ireland and different versions around Scotland of the same story, you know, and there's characters going back and forward from the stories, and again, I mentioned that in the articles about uh, poor Cucullin, you know, in Ireland, Cucullin is this mythic hero, you know, and all this kind of stuff, but people would forget that in Scotland, the version is that uh, to learn to be a sword fighter, he had to go to the greatest sword fighters in the world, which were, of course, the women of Scotland. So he had to go to Scotland to learn to sword fight. But unfortunately, the women of Scotland, the dirty whores, said, we'll only teach you the sword fighting if you... Uh, how do you pass delicately? Uh, if, if you romantically engage with us in a physical manner. Okay? <laughs> say that, yeah. So I, do you know, there was soft play and there was sword play, Kelly. That's all I'm going to say. All right? People out there looking. All right? So all these stories, um, you know, between the two countries have been going back and forth and changing and oh, mutating and all the time. Does that answer your question, Kelly? I seem to have forgot the question now, yeah, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> you answered right, like my number three question, so that was great. Oh, Good oh. job. Fantastic. <laughs> it's my R's, you see. It's my magic R's. <laughs> yes. yes. No, that was great. That brings us to time to hear another story, which is great for me, so I get to sit back and listen. So what are you going to tell us about this time, Rob? Do you know what? I was thinking I was going to tell um, one of the stories I like to tell my children. Um, the, the one... The City Beneath the Waves is not a very well-known um, story, whereas this one is quite well-known, so some in your audience might know this one as well. But the, you've got to imagine yourself, as a child, listening to this story. Oh, I thought, excuse me, that we, can, we can feed that into the story, okay? Somehow, I'll bring that in somewhere. Um, it's, it's a story, it's about, um, there was a, a, a child born, and um, when the child was born, he had a hump on his back, okay? And as he got older, the hump got bigger. I eventually get so big the hump that when the child sat down he had to hold his chin in his hands. The, the hump the hump was so big. But you know, as the child got older and older, he never cursed his parents or cursed God or anything. He just carried on with life as well as he could. And the thing was his hands were wonderful and he was great at making things. He could make things from reeds or recycle stuff and he could make lovely uh, toys and hats and all this. So when he came, he became a, a, a young man, and this is a long time ago, 150 years ago or so. But then he became a young man, he was going around Ireland with a wee cart with all these things he'd made and he'd sell them. And he'd make enough money just to kind of put a roof over his head and, and feed himself, you know. But he was still quite poor and he wore rags. But he wore the, um, the foxglove, you know, the big foxglove flower. And foxglove in Irish is, is Lus Moore, the, the grand hair, but the big hair. And um, so he became known as Lus Moore. And uh, the story itself is about one day Lus Moore, he was out and he was with his little car and he was selling things. 
and he, he got a wee bit too far from home and night was coming on and he realised he wouldn't get back in time before the night got really cold so he'd have to find somewhere to sleep and he was out in the countryside and he was looking about and he saw a hill and he figured you know he could lie against the hill and his hump could get a bit comfy on the hill as well so he went to this hill not grafting and he lay against the side of the hill and he was cold and he was shivering and he was a wee bit sad but you know he was trying to cool it down and trying to be warm and he was lying there he suddenly heard a sound and it was a very quiet sound and it was a sound of singing and it was like a thousand voices singing but they were so quiet they were as quiet as Kelly if you've ever been in your garden and listened to two caterpillars talking do you know they're that quiet that was as quiet as the singing okay it was very quiet but it was absolutely beautiful the way the the voices harmonised and the rose and they sang and he was listening to the singing and he was almost not wanting to breathe just because he didn't want to miss any of the song and it was a, most, it was a very simple song it was just and he was listening to this over and over again and he began to sing it as well and then he had his own line Agus J K D and he no sooner added his own line to the song when suddenly a huge wind <coughs> roared out of nowhere and grabbed a hold of Lusmore and tossed him into the air and he was getting thrown round and round ah, and it threw him towards the hill and the next thing <coughs> he was in Inside the hill. I mean, he was inside the hill. Oh, he was building round and round and round in the wind. He was absolutely terrified. And then the wind began a little bit slower and slower, like a bit more gentle. And the wind was holding him up inside this huge cave. And he was kind of going round, and he could see all around the cave there was little lanterns made of silver and gold. And then he heard the singing again. And he looked down. And far below him, there was all these little people about this size. And they were all looking up at him. And they were smiling and they were singing along. J And the wind slowly, slowly took him down to the ground. Haggis J K D. And he was sat there. And one of the little people, these little people, ran over and jumped on his knee and said, Lusmore. Lusmore. Your words we adore. That hump you were born is no more, Lusmore. Look on the floor, Lusmore. Look on the floor. And Lusmore looked on the floor and his hump had fallen off his back and was on the ground beside him. And a lot of people said, Stand up, Lusmore. Stand up, Lusmore. So Lusmore had never stood straight in his life and he slowly began to straighten himself up and he began to stand, which you know, was a bit unsure and a bit unsettled and they're all going to stand up and they're all smiling. And he began to stand and stand and he was so overcome with emotion that suddenly he began weeping and he fainted away and he fell to the ground. Well, the next day he woke up and he was back outside, not crafting, lying against the side of the hill. And he was thinking, it must have been a dream. But then as he stood up, he realised there was no hump there. He put his hand on his back and the hump was gone. And then he looked down, his rags were gone as well and he was wearing a lovely, lovely suit. So he stood up and he was looking at the suit and he realised it had all been real. So he said, oh, thank you to the people in the hill. A wee prayer of thanks to God. And he got his wee cap and he began walking home again. And as he was walking home, he would see these neighbours and he was saying, how are you doing? And they were saying, how are you? And who, who are you? And he says, oh, it's Lusmore. And the word went all around the country to say, Lusmore's been changed. Lusmore's been changed. And so it was. He went back to his wee house and now he just suit and he was standing up straight and he was very handsome. But the thing was, even though he'd been changed physically, he hadn't changed as a person. He didn't become proud or boastful. He just carried on making these little hats and toys and going round and selling them and then a couple of weeks after he'd been changed the tap at his door and he opened the door and there was a woman there 
And the woman says, I'm looking for Lost Moore. Lost Moore said, I, I am he. And she said, oh, it's true. It's true. You've been changed. You used to have a hump and it's gone. He said, that's right. I had a hump and uh, it's gone. And have you got a new suit? And the woman said, oh, tell me how it happened because my son, Jack Madden, he's a terrible, terrible hump and it makes him so angry and bitter. I wonder, could you tell me how you get out of yours? Lost Moore said, of course, come away in. So she went into the house, made her a cup of tea, and he told her about the hill and how he lay down beside the hill and he heard the singing and he added a line to the song and the fairies took him in and took away his hump and gave him a suit. Oh, said the woman, tell me where the hill is. And Lost Moore said, of course. And he got a bit of paper and he drew a little map and he gave her the directions. She said, thank you very, very much. I'll do that this evening. So the woman went back to her son, her son Jack Madden. And Jack Madden, he was very similar to Lost Moore, you know, the same age and the way Lost Moore used to look, he had a big hump on him and he was kind of twisted with a hump. But when Lost Moore had always been kind, Jack Madden, he was a bitter, bitter, bitter man. He was the kind of person if he said, how are you doing? He said, how dare you? How dare you? Ah, you smell. Oh, he was just, oh, he cursed, he'd swear on all sorts. So his mammy said to him, Jack, Jack Madden, I know how to get rid of your hump. Oh, mommy, don't you lie to me, mommy. Mommy, mommy, oh, I know you, mommy. Oh. She said, no, no. I found a man lost more, and he got rid of his hump. How do you do it, mommy? So she explained to him about the hell not crafting, and how if he lies down beside it, nice and patient and calm, and waits to hear the singing, and adds a line to the song, he'll be taken into the hill, and his hump will be taken away. Mammy, all right, Mammy, we'll do it, Mammy, but you better not be lying, Mammy, you better not be lying. So Jack Madden's Mammy, she put him in a wee cart, she followed him up, she got to knock Grafton Hill, it's coming on tonight, and she put her son beside the hill, and she said, now Jack Madden, listen to me, lie there and wait till you hear the singing, and when you hear the singing, add your own line to the song, but Jack, be calm and patient and sing kindly. Okay, Jack. And he looked at his mammy and went, yeah, Okay, mammy, I'll be patient. I'll be kind. Go on, mammy, go away, go away. So the mammy left. And she left Jack Madden lying on the hill. And he was lying there with his wee hump and he was cold. And he was not patient. He was going, Come on, fairies, come on. Where's the singing? Come on, where's the singing? I want to get rid of my hump. I want to get rid of my hump. I want a suit. Come on. And he stopped his thought. In fact, I want two suits. I'm going to add two lines to the song. Come on, fairies, hurry up, hurry up. And then the music started. The all singing. Jude. Come on, fairies, go faster. Jude. Come on, come on, for fuck's sake, come on. I guess Jude. His two lines to the song, and suddenly a huge wind came up and grabbed a hold of Jack Madden and wheeled him towards the hill. And the next thing he found himself in the hill and he was going faster and faster and faster. And the wind did not get gentle. The wind whoop, threw him to the ground. Bang! Ow! And he looked up. And there was all the little people, and their eyes were blazing with anger. And they were all pointing at Jack Madden. And one of them, they ran up to his knee and said, Jack Madden, Jack Madden, your words have come so bad in this place that you're had in for that. Two humps, Jack Madden, two humps. And 20 little fairies ran over carrying Wasmore's hump. They jumped on Jack Madden's back and nailed Wasmore's hump to his. Bang, 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 bang. And then they kicked him out of the hill. Well, the next morning, his mammy came along and she found Jack Madden lying on the hill with two humps. And he was lying there cursing and spitting on the same language which I will not repeat. His mammy put him in the cart 
you took him home and you put him to bed. And he lay there for three days cursing and roaring and swearing and spitting. And on the third day, he died of bitterness. And his very last words before he died were a curse on anyone that goes singing with the fairies. What's your name? Well done, well done. I liked the kind of moral of that story. That was good. <laughs> if you're going to be a happy person, you're going to be a happy person. And if you're going to be miserable, you'll miserable. find a way to stay miserable. Guys, <laughs> if people want to see the stories, I actually tell the stories in the, the Crane Bar. I forgot to mention the Crane Bar, didn't I? I yeah, tell please. Yeah. Well, from June onwards, I'll be telling stories in the Crane Bar. So people can come and join us there. And they'll hear millions of stories from Scotland and Ireland. And uh, there'll be rude stories, sad stories, funny stories, thoughtful stories. Okay? Very good. So if you're going to be in Ireland, in, Gal in Galway specifically, um, this summer, starting in June, you can see Rab at the Crane Bar, which is a great venue. I've been to a few things there. And Rab has kindly invited me to, to come see him this summer, and I'm definitely going to do it. Oh, and um, Rab, if people are not going to be in, in Ireland, um, they can also find your books, can't, can't they? Can you tell us about they your can. books? Oh, my goodness, I forgot. Um, the story I told earlier... Um, the City Beneath the Waves, that's one of the stories in this. This is Galway Bay Folk Tales. And there's lots of lovely stories, my reimagining of stories in there. And then the other thing I like about when I was saying earlier about how I can step into folk tales, and I really enjoy them, but they also shape my writing. And so this is another book which is um, Transformation. And it's a love story set in Galway. It's, it's one I made up, it's my own story. But I'm. Um, I use a creature from folklore, quite a terrifying creature, kind of impacts the story of these two lovers, and bad things happen. And then, Kelly, really bad things happen. Okay? It's quite okay. scary. Don't read it alone. Don't read it in the dark. Okay? So, I'm okay. Just, that's the two there. All right? Hold those covered up a little higher there, Ram. We can see ah, them a little bit. This. Yeah, that's it. That's it. The All Transformation right. and Galway Bay Folk Tales, both by Rob Fulton. You need to pick up your copies. Now, people can find those on Amazon, right? Yeah, Amazon, um, most of the bookshops in Galway as well, here about, and at the, the shows in the Crane Bar every Thursday night. Oh, uh, very good. So I know I've seen, I can them, sign in, them. I've seen them in Charlie Barron's bookshop in, in Galway. Yeah, you get Charlie Barron's, Dubray's, Easton's, everywhere. Very good. All right. Well, I'm sure everybody will want to do that. And you can also check out Rab's website. Give us that website address, Rab. It's uh, rabfultonstories.weebly.com. So just put in Rab Fulton Stories in Google. And Rab, it's not Rob, it's Rab, R-A-B. It rhymes with fab. Fab Rab. <laughs> Think of that. Fab so, Rab. Right, yeah. Rab Fulton oh, okay. Stories. All right, so find, uh, and I know Rob has a blog there, and he's also got some video and um, more oh, stories that and poetry. There's all kinds of good stuff there. So that's at rabfultonstories.weebly.com. Yeah. And you can also see more of Rab's writing on thewildgeese.irish on yeah. our Irish Myths and Legends focus. So make sure you check out all of those articles. They're very, very good. Um, and, yeah, and, and go check out Rab at the Korean Bar. Any you, any Kelly. parting words for us, Rob? Did you have anything else for everybody? No, I, I, it's been lovely. It's been lovely sharing the stories and chatting to you all and chatting to yourself, Kelly. It's been fabulous. Thank you very much. Well, we've enjoyed it so much, too, and we're just coming to the end of our time here, folks. Um, but we do need to thank our sponsors. We'll do that now. Um, and we have, um, for, for this week's uh, focus, we do have Balik Fine China sponsoring us, as well as Fallers Jewelers. Uh, Ogre Skin Care, Malin Foundry, um, and we have 1916uprising.ie, which makes um, commemorative coins and other memorabilia about them, the 1916 Easter Uprising. Also, Finn McCool's Irish Pub in New Orleans is sponsoring us. And we couldn't bring you this feature and this fun evening with Rap without the support of these fine Irish companies, so we encourage you to support them in return if you can. 
uh, go to our website and you can find out more about each of these really great sponsors. So, for Mulgi, thanks so much, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Bye. So. Long. so long.